3D printing, great for printing prototypes and Pikachus, but is it actually useful for real-world punishing applications? Well, I 3D printed key components in a combat robot and took it to the Robo Wars Championships to find out. Let's get started. This is Vanguard, a combat robot built for the 13.6 kilogram or 30 pound featherweight combat robot class. It was built for the QUT Robotica Robo Wars event, which took place a few weeks ago in Brisbane, Australia. By the way, this is gonna be a long video, so if you're interested in key aspects of the build, you can find the timestamps in the video description. So before I go into the concept, design, and manufacturing of Vanguard, I want to address some common misconceptions about robot combat. These machines are remotely controlled rather than autonomous, which can get some people a little bit fired up over calling them robots, but the term was coined back in the 1990s and it's stuck ever since, and here we are. So instead of thinking about combat robotics as a programming challenge, think of it as more of a design and engineering challenge. You can't build past the weight limit and there are rules for safety, such as no projectiles or liquid weapons, or for entertainment, such as no jamming devices. But beyond those rules, it's pretty much fair game. Vanguard's design originates from a machine I built back in 2010 called Roadkill, which was built almost entirely from scrap bits of steel in a few days leading up to the competition. The thing is, Roadkill was actually really good at just surviving and actually won its first ever national event, despite being way under the weight limit. I really like the concept of a tiny, heavily armored machine, but other than just wedging and pushing, Roadkill couldn't really do anything more than just survive. So I drafted up the concept for Vanguard, a steel armored brick, which could also hit back with a tiny vertical disc at the front. This weapon wasn't ever intended to cause massive damage. It's only really one kilogram in weight, but it's there to just sort of annoy and hopefully outlast its opponents and that's the design intent of Vanguard. So the design was drawn up entirely in Fusion 360 and the final CAD is a huge mess now after being chopped and changed so many times during the build process. My biggest mistake was not to create components of the frame members early on, which means the timeline is a, is a huge disaster trail. And this was the most complex assembly I've ever drawn entirely in Fusion. So I learned a lot about its quirks and features compared to something like SolidWorks. And while there's definitely an advantage of drawing the frame in the one project, you're still much better off, in my opinion, catting your components separately and then bringing them in. Nonetheless, the 3D model served as a really good indicator for the design decisions, such as the larger wheels to ensure the machine was invertible. If it did get flipped, it could still drive. And I was actually really chuffed with how well these compound angles went. They were a real nightmare to draw. But they actually came out quite nicely. So, do you like technical details? Well. Here you go. For the frame, I went with a combination of mild steel rectangle hollow sections and six millimeter thick Hardox 450. Hardox is a class of steel known as wear plate, and it's used extensively in the mining industry for everything from dump trucks to the teeth on diggers. And it's awesome for robots because it's made with an extra hard surface, but a softer inner portion, which prevents it from just shattering like a through hardened tool steel might. It's also very heavy though, as you might imagine, being steel, which is why the robot frame needs to be so tiny and compact to get it into the weight limit if you build it out of steel. The frame itself is only 50 millimeters high, which is why I can get so much armor onto this little thing. For the drive motors, we've progressed quite a bit since the days of using cordless drill gearboxes, though they're still valid for some design decisions. For Vanguard, however, the frame was so tiny, I needed to go with something more compact and I went with these. These are Bainbot's P60s. They're purpose-made gearboxes for combat robots and similar platforms, but they cost an absolute fortune to bring into Australia. There's no comparable product on the market though, so BotBits in Australia were organizing a group buy, so I sucked it up and bought two for the robot and one for a spare. Attached to the gearboxes, I used NTM brushless outrunners sourced from Hobby King, which are good quality and not too pricey. Sensorless brushless motor control has come a very long way over the last few years thanks to the huge popularity of quadcopters, which means I can control the motors in this robot so precisely there's almost no forward and reverse delay using Simon K firmware running on ZTW50 amp electronic speed controllers. To flash them, you also need the correct firmware and you'll need a programmer like this, but it's a fairly straightforward affair. 
For my weapon motor, I went with a 5045 size outrunner and a cheap ass super simple 50 amp speed controller to control it. And honestly, I would probably change this to an in runner the next time because it doesn't spin quite as fast as I'd like at the 18 volts or so I'm running this machine on. It's running a five cell lithium polymer pack. And speaking of batteries, I went with Zippy LiPos, 30, 35C and 2700 milliamp hour. And these worked great as well. I actually use, only used this pack during the whole event, just charging it between fights. Weapon hardware in Vanguard consists of a 20 millimeter hardened rod with a bronze bushing to allow the disc to spin freely with some grease. And it, the disc is 16 millimeters thick hardox and it was driven off the motor with these timing belts. So these belts are designed normally to bite into teeth on the other side, but we actually lathe them off on the output shaft on the output side to allow the weapon to slip in impacts, which protects the motor. And it kind of worked mostly until the last fight anyway. But what about 3D printed parts, Angus? Where are those? Well, check this out. To really put 3D printed parts to the test, I made these. So the robot uses these four inch wheels, which I didn't really want to hang directly off the gearboxes because they're really expensive in case they got hit and damaged. So I printed these really fat spur gears to allow a small additional reduction and drive them off the gearbox to these wheels. The spur gears were modeled using Fusion 360's built-in gear generator script, which works perfectly. And they're printed from Polymaker PC Max which I tested in my 3D printed off-road platform a few months ago. During the testing of that platform, I realized that it actually might work for the huge violent demands of a combat robot, so I decided to give it a shot. Of course, even the strongest plastics won't hold up small threads, so I decided to get creative, and when I attached the gears to the output shaft, I used these awesome M3 threaded inserts, which I picked up when I was in Shenzhen last year. You have to make sure the hole is slightly undersized and you just put them on the end of a soldering iron and just melt them into place. And to make sure they didn't come out, I just sort of moved some, melted some of the plastic back over the top of them and they worked really well. These didn't come off or slip at all during the competition. For the output though, things were a little bit more tricky. The wheels I went with are casters with molded in 15 millimeter internal diameter bearings. Yeah, it's a pretty weird size from Richmond Casters, and they're super grippy and effective, plus only five bucks each. But how does one mount a gear to this weirdly shaped wheel? Well, through the magic of 3D printing, I was able to closely model a hub, which fitted into the contours of the wheel using a G clamp. I could hold them together and put five M4 screws into the wheel, holding the gear in place. And honestly, I was shocked at how precise and true that these spin, despite the kludgy method of attaching them. Something less wind though was the shaft for the wheels. Originally I was going to use 3D printed mounts with aluminium, but both just proved far too soft and I could see it just stripping out from just driving around. So in the end, I lathed a 15 to 10 millimeter spacer, got an M10 bolt and got a aluminium block CNC'd with the thread for the M10. So it just tightens up to the spacer, to the, M, to the aluminium block and these worked fantastically and these were created using CNC. CNC, you might ask, well, yeah, we actually use CNC on this machine as well, including boring out the disc to fit the bushing. And if you want to see more CNC work on Maker's Muse, definitely let me know in the comments. I'm actually pretty keen to start pursuing it. The 3D printed parts for Vanguard didn't stop there though. There's 3D printed parts that hold the battery in place. There's 3D printed parts for the power distribution and wire guides. And I've even 3D printed the case for the battery using Fibology's Filiflex, which is this really cool semi-flex material I tested recently, and it works great. It protected the battery, kept it nice and safe, and it's hot pink as well. Speaking of the printing, all the PC Max parts were printed on my trusty Up Mini 2, which prints polycarbonates really well. Polycarbonate filaments are really challenging to print, so if you want to try printing with PC Max or other polycarb filaments, make sure you have a heated bed, enclosed chamber, which is also keeping the heat in, and make sure your hot end is capable of printing at the 260, 270 degrees C you need to print the filament. I couldn't be more happy with the part quality I was getting off the Up Mini 2, especially considering I was printing a lot of these parts at 0.3 layer heights, near solid infill, and fast. I had to get them pumped out, including my spares, before I left for the competition. And here's a photo of the finished robot ready to go. Flights were booked at allegedly 12 p.m. on the Friday before the weekend event. And well, thanks Virgin for canceling our flights till halfway through the competition. Oh, and charging me $80 cancellation fee for the return flights. 
how can I return from the city I never flew to in the first place? Thanks guys. Anyway, we decided to drive there and after a crazy cannonball run, we did make it to the robot event and Vanguard was ready to go for its first fight. Here's how it went down. First fight was drawn up against Mini Mower, whose builder has been in the sport since it started in Australia way back in the early 2000s. Mini Mower isn't exactly the most dangerous robot, but it does have a low speed vertical drum, which, and it's built like an absolute tank, so it's very reliable and very hard to make stop working. Vanguard, on the other hand, is a totally brand new robot, untested, and it was built from brand new parts. When it comes to maiden fights for combat robots, it's pretty much guaranteed something stupid will go wrong and break. And on top of that, I had untested 3D printed components in my little robot. The fight started out good with both bots tinking away at each other and getting some really good sparks, but no real damage. And then as quickly as it started, nothing. Vanguard just died. Why this? This stupid power link popped out of the robot due to the vertical forces it experienced. Lame. <laughs> It's worth noting that this happened to no less than four other robots during the competition, so it was a bit of a common thing to happen. So I fixed it by putting some tape over the top cover, over where the link sits, and that stopped it happening in any other fights. But it was a pretty lame start. But how about the 3D printed gears? Well, to my dismay, one of the pinions had lost a couple of teeth. <sighs> Absolutely devastating. All that effort wasted. The concept failed. Well, actually looking closer at the failed print, it looks like there was a layer which had some under extrusion and it seems that that's where it sheared. So there must have been something that went wrong during the print and then it just cascaded and broke a few teeth behind it. So with nothing to lose, I ripped the old pinion off and put a spare on. I printed a lot of spares for this robot and I got ready for the next fight. All the parts, all the other parts seemed intact though, including the weapon spacer, which actually is holding the pulley to the weapon, it's under tension. I expected that to just explode instantly, and it didn't, which is really cool. And I got ready for another robot called Final Cut, a vicious vertical spinner, which sadly had suffered damage in its previous fight and wasn't spinning. So this fight went the full three minutes, and amazingly, the gears worked. But other things started to fail. Most notably, I'd forgotten that screws vibrate loose during robot fights. I forgot to use Loctite in some areas, so the weapon motor screws came loose and showered the robot with sparks as the screws ran into the steel pulley. And then one of my drive motors came loose and flopped around the robot till it unplugged itself. Vanguard still won, just, but yeah, the gears held. And apart from the other problems, the gears were actually wearing in really nicely and the robot was really easy to control, which was super cool and we're really happy with that. So I got the robot fixed and then it went up against another robot called Bashbot, a wedge style robot. So I quickly discovered at the start of this fight, I'd plugged the motor back in backwards so the robot was almost impossible to control, but the weapon actually worked really well in this fight. Unfortunately, Bashbot also had drive problems of his own and eventually Bashbot just eventually moved, slowed down to a crawl and then stopped entirely. And yeah, as I said, the, the weapon actually worked great in this fight and I got some really good hits onto Vashbot. Not too much damage to him though, but once again, the 3D printed parts held up. And this robot was driving around, you know, hitting things, bouncing around. You know, these gears are under a lot of pressure, a lot of forces, and they didn't break. Pretty cool. Vanguard's final fight was against Frags, a massively destructive robot which annihilated the arena in its previous fight and then blew up its drive controllers. I actually spent the lead up to our fight helping him fix the thing, but unfortunately his weapon still died early on in our fight. Still, Frags is awesomely driven, has high traction and most importantly, lower front wedges than Vanguard does. So I spent most of the match getting pushed around, getting some good hits on him, but otherwise, he won the fight due to superior control and aggression. Oh well. So Vanguard wasn't the only robot to have 3D printed parts at the event, but it was the only one to use them in such critical roles and still survive several fights without breaking. Some other bots consisted of PLA or ABS parts, but these tended to fail in the fights quite spectacularly, and I was quite surprised that ABS didn't survive as long as I would expect it to. Frags also had a PETG box with his electronics, and when the electronics went up, and broke. Uh, the box got super gooey but didn't catch fire, which is pretty cool and does reflect my findings found earlier last year during my burn tests. 
and nylons were also featured in a few machines. Nylon is very difficult to print, but it definitely stood up to the abuse. So I might try nylon next time in my robot instead of PC for applications where I could benefit from a slight amount of flex rather than PC, which is a lot more rigid, but tends to shatter or crack rather than nylon, which actually can't really crack, it just tears, which is really quite interesting. And I've certainly got a range of filaments from various suppliers to test out, as well as carbon fiber filled and the Olsen Ruby nozzle to handle them, so keep an eye out for an update. At the end of the day though, even the best plastic parts won't be replacing metal for these larger machines, but I see no reason why you couldn't completely 3D print a smaller machine and have it stand up to all kinds of abuse. I know a lot of the 150 gram ant weight robots, they fit on the palm of your hand, are actually 3D printed now, so it'd be super cool to see these guys try polycarbonates and nylons, or maybe if you'd like to see me try making one of those small robots, definitely let me know in the comments below. FDM 3D printing definitely doesn't deserve its reputation as being only capable of producing useless knickknacks with no real strength, but you do have to be clever with the technology and how you use it. Also, these super high strength filaments are not easy to print. They're not beginner materials and I certainly wouldn't be using PLA for any structural components, even though it's super easy to print. And that's gonna do it guys. Vanguard will return and this stupid thing is like two kilos under the weight limit, so a bigger weapon is definitely a must for next time. If you enjoyed this video, please do let me know. It took an awful lot of effort to pull this thing off and take it to the competition. So please do consider subscribing so you don't miss any future videos. My name's Angus and I look forward to seeing you again very shortly here on Maker's Muse. Catch you later guys, bye.